on. Uh, colleagues, I think this is where I left off. Nathan Obed, the president of Inuit Tepirat Kanatami, told our committee, we have seen no government-wide implementation of the structures that have been tried, that we have tried to build with the government of Canada on systematically upholding our rights and allowing for our participation in things such as legislative processes like regulations. Therefore, we have very little confidence that we would participate and be able to co-develop these regulations. Similarly, Paul Erngott, Vice President, none of it, Tungavik, told us, I really don't have a lot of confidence if it's passed very quickly. As we've seen in the past, we need to be consulted on this Firearms Act, just so that people are aware and can voice their concerns. Chief Jessica Lazar of the Mohawk Council of Kanawaki said, we also have concerns about meaningful consultation for regulations because it will deeply affect how our people can carry themselves and carry their firearms. So we would like to have a closer look at what that looks like. When this was discussed in committee, some senators said, they wanted to get a better idea of what future consultations should look like. For instance, Senator Cardozo asked Chief Lazar, the way I understand it is that if this bill passes, the department in charge would then be in charge of developing the regulations. We could consider this as a Senate committee is, to be fairly specific, in terms of what we suggest to them about how to go about these consultations, recognizing that they didn't take place earlier on when the government was developing the bill. Would that be the way to go? Chief Lazar responded, yes. The way to go would be to set up an initial meeting that would have to consist of a plan for meaningful engagement. You need to have a plan to ensure that you cover all sectors and all the needs of both parties. In order to do that, we need to have that initial meeting. R responding to all this witness testimony, an amendment was then proposed at our committee to ensure that the regulatory process on firearms be informed by consultations with Indigenous peoples. But that amendment was defeated by the majority of the government senators, including, of course, by Senator Cardozo as well. So the regulatory process remains entirely in the hands of the government to do with it what it wants. It has failed to engage in any consultations to date. And unfortunately, that is what we can also expect going forward. I now want to turn my remarks to addressing what some of the outcomes are when a government does not consult. The main outcome is that it will likely produce a very bad bill. In C21, we can see this outcome in two areas in particular, namely in the proposed ban on the purchase and sale of legal handguns. And in the expanded definition of what constitutes a prohibited firearm. Turning first to the ban on the purchase and sale of legal guns. This component of the bill is the most gratuitous element in the bill because it targets about 650,000 law-abiding Canadians for essential, essentially no supportable reason. The firearms that have been used by licensed sports shooters and collectors for many decades and are held under very strict conditions in Canada. We need to remind ourselves, colleagues, about the very specific restrictions that already apply to all restricted firearms owners in Canada. They must all pass the restricted firearms training course, go through and remain subject to continuous police background checks. Only, and before the current freeze, acquire handguns for either sport shooting or collecting. 
only transport them to an approved shooting range. Always store and transport their handguns double locked and only transport them as approved by the CFO of their province and individually register all their restricted firearms. I do not believe that most Canadians or even senators are actually aware of all the restrictions that already reply, apply to restricted license holders. But by framing the issue as simply as possible and by presenting the ban on the purchase and the sale of legal handguns as a simple option, the government hopes its simplistic messaging will sell to what they hope is an uninformed public. If we are going to be frank, Senator Dasko adopted a similar approach in a poll she commissioned a few weeks ago. Her poll asked whether respondents supporting, supported freezing the sale and transport and importation of handguns. Senator Dasko proclaimed that 73% of Canadians either supported or somewhat supported this government objective. But what context was provided in that poll about Canada's already existing handgun laws? Were the respondents told that it is only licensed sports shooters and collectors who can legally hold own handguns in Canada? Were all the existing legal restrictions clearly explained to respondents? When a poll asks a general question but provides no context, the result is predetermined. What Canadians will find out in the years ahead is that C-21's ban on the purchase and the sale of legal, already tightly controlled handguns will not make Canadians any safer. As nearly every witness who appeared before our committee pointed out, the vast majority of handguns being used in crime in Canada are being smuggled into this country. Professor Noah Schwartz testified before the committee and pointed out that in Montreal, 95% of handguns used were illegal, and 79% of all traced handguns in Ontario were foreign sourced, largely coming from the United States. Professor Christian Lupert of the Royal Military College of Canada told our committee, the data is unequivocal. Well over 90% of firearms seized in the commission of a crime or that are possessed unlawfully in Canada have been smuggled by organized crime from the United States. Show me the data that supports this bill. There is none. Marshall Wilson, who was formerly involved in criminal activity in the City of Toronto at a senior level confirmed at our committee that gang members are not only are only interested in illegal firearms that are untraceable and that the primary source of such firearms is the United States. In essence, the reality is this. Banning the sale and purchase of legal handguns will not reduce firearms in circulation because the bill provides that such firearms will only be taken from the estates of such individuals Without any, without any compensation after their death. This measure will, for instance, have no impact on suicides because you are not actually reducing legal handguns in circulation. Furthermore, a fact that government senators often miss, every holder of a restricted firearms license already also automatically holds a non-restricted firearms license for long guns. That means that they can possess all long guns in addition to their handguns. So how does limiting what restricted license holders can do with only one class of firearm impact any of the other firearms that these individuals already legally possess? The truth, of course, is it doesn't. Therefore, there can be no impact on the problem of suicides by firearm, nor will there be any material impact on the larger problem of stolen firearms. 
A number of police officers, both serving and retired, testified before a committee on this very specific point. The officers who testified were unanimous that Bill C-21 would not impact the problem of handgun crime in Canada. Mr. Andre <coughs> Shalana, formerly a detective sergeant with the Montreal Police, stated that there is no link between the gang violence in Montreal and firearms illegally held by sport shooters. His colleague, Stefan Wall, also formerly of the Montreal, made the exact same point. Even though senior police officers who gave the government the benefit of the doubt on Bill C-21 were nevertheless quite clear in noting their skepticism about the bill's effectiveness. Bill 40 of the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police told our committee, and I quote, regarding the issue of smuggling and trafficking, the CACP continues to maintain that restricting lawful firearms ownership will not meaningfully address the issue of illegal firearms obtained from the United States. Similarly, the Deputy Chief, Deputy Chief Fiona Wilson of the Vancouver Police told the committee that, to date in Vancouver, we have had 22 shots fired incidents in 2023, resulting in three homicides and 16 people wounded. 15 of the 21 incidents have confirmed or suspected links to gangs. She also said that without exception, firearms crime does not emanate from licensed gun owners. And what the government's current efforts to tackle the real problem, and what of the government's current efforts to tackle the real problem of firearm smuggling? Mark Weber, National President, Customs and Immigration Union, told our committee that much of what the government does at our border is actually only security theater, in his words. While Aaron McCrory, Vice President, Intelligence and Enforcement Branch, Canada Border Services Agency told our committee that the results that CBSA has achieved at the border in stopping firearm <coughs> smuggling are, quote, a great success and we're, we're very proud of it. Mark Weber strongly rejected this claim when he testified. Mr. Weber told our committee this, the agency's ability to stem the flow of illegal firearms has not improved a bit over the past two years. Border officers still lack the ability to act between ports of entry, making it harder to address problematic situations in a timely fashion. Tools such as mobile x-rays that could help in intercepting illegal contraband, including dangerous firearms, frequently break down. There is still an almost 0% chance that any illegal weapon entering the country through rail would ever be found. Any thinking person would le be legitimately concerned about this imbalance in the current bill. We were told by a number of witnesses that the government's measure to increase the maximum penalty for firearms trafficking from 10 to 14 years will have no impact on trafficking because the current maximum of 10 years is never imposed by our courts. I noted this fact during my second reading remarks, and unfortunately, that conclusion was confirmed by witness testimony. Senator Youssef asked officials from the Department of Justice what the average sentence was for firearms trafficking. Mr. Matthew Taylor, General Counsel and Director of Criminal Law Policy Section of Justice Canada responded by noting that. In 2019-20, there was one conviction resulting in imprisonment of more than two years. In 2018, sentencing was from as low as three to six months to more than two years. So the sentences are what they are. The government is evidently fine with that result since government senators rejected all amendments that were proposed to restore some minimum sentencing 
for firearms offenses that were repealed under Bill C-5. Senators should understand what that means. It means that people in our most vulnerable communities will continue to suffer the most from gun crime. This is what Mr. Marshall Wilson told our committee related to the claim Bill C-21 will tackle gun crime. He said, please stop exploiting people who have already been through enough for a political agenda. We know better, we want better, we deserve better. I can assure Senators opposite of this, Canadians either know or will soon find out that Bill C-21 is a smokescreen. It is a smokescreen that makes legal gun owners scapegoats. It will do nothing to reduce real gun crime. In particular, it does nothing to help people in our most vulnerable communities. And that will become very evident as gun and gang crimes continue to rise. The final element in this bill that I wish to address is the expanded definition of prohibited firearm that the bill contains. Before I discuss this specific provision, I think we need to remember that certain firearms have been prohibited for civilian use in Canada for a very long time. These include fully automatic firearms. They include semi-automatic firearms, center, semi-automatic center firearms that shoot more than five rounds. They include sawed-off shotguns. They include short barrel pistols. They include various other firearms that have from time to time been selected for prohibition for one reason or another. But now, in Bill C-21, and building on the order and council that the government enacted in 2020, the definition of prohibited firearm is to be further expanded in a largely meaningless matter. In the bill, the government expands the definition of a prohibited firearm to include a firearm that incorporates all of the following criteria. It is not a handgun. It discharges center firearm fire ammunition in a semi-automatic manner. It was originally designed with a detachable cartridge magazine with a capacity of six cartridges or more. And it is designed or manufactured on or after the day of which this paragraph comes into force. All of these criteria must apply for the firearm in question to be prohibited under the new definition. <coughs> when Senator Youssef spoke to the bill at third reading, he claimed that this bill has nothing to do with long guns. Well, I am sorry, but this clause in the bill, which amends subsection 84 bracket 1 of the Act, is only about long guns. In fact, the clause specifically in excludes handguns. As we heard from witnesses, there are numerous problems with this proposed definition. What the government is attempting to define as an assault-style firearm for which there actually is no definition. I am sure that if many Canadians were asked what that term meant, they would say it means a firearm capable of being fired in a fully automatic manner. Indeed, if we think of any military rifle in service today, that is what such a rifle, rifle would be capable of. But as I said, such rifles have been legally prohibited for civilian use in Canada for decades. So, instead, the government now proposes to expand the perspective definition to also prohibit firearms simply because they happen to discharge ammunition in a semi-automatic manner. But it will only define such firearms as prohibited if they are manufactured after the date on which the act comes into force. This means that exactly the same firearm will either be prohibited or legal simply based on the date of manufacture. 
This is akin to saying the same make of a car manufactured is either prohibited or legal based on the date that it was manufactured. It literally, colleagues, makes no sense. Theoretically, this provision could impact well over a million hunting firearms in Canada. Firearms that are actually classified as non-restricted under current Canadian law and which have been assessed as being entirely appropriate for hunting purposes. But it will not apply in that manner because all of the semi-automatic uh, semi firearms already in Canada are exempt from the provision. So too is any semi-automatic rifle that might be imported, as long as it was manufactured before the date on which the provision comes into force. Senators should understand what this means. This means that literally tens of millions of semi-automatic firearms are eligible for import into Canada, simply based on the date that they were made. I really need to ask, what does this and how does this enhance public safety? Of course, the answer is that it has n absolutely no impact on public safety. In his third reading remark, Senator Yusuf claimed that the fact that the measure is ineffective means that long guns are not impacted by the bill. If that is the case, then why have the provision in the bill at all? In fact, an amendment was proposed at committee for the section concerned to be deleted from the bill. But again, government senators, including Senator Yusuf, voted against that amendment. Senator Yusuf cannot have it both ways. He cannot say that nothing in the bill impacts long gun owners and then vote against the amendment deleting the clause which references long guns. Mm -hmm. In this regard, we have to be aware of what the government is signaling about what it intends to do. It may be signaling that it will try to do through regulation what it failed to do through legislation last year. <laughs> because so many semi-automatic firearms are non-restricted and used for hunting. When the government attempted to enact a wide prohibition last year, hunters across the country, including of course indigenous hunters, understandably reacted very negatively. They did so because the broad prohibition that was being proposed had no credible justification. I do think that stakeholders are right to be very concerned about the government's future intent. It seems highly probable that the government still has the aspiration to do through the back door what it tried and failed to do through the front door. Many witnesses, particularly indigenous hunters, share that concern. They are rightly worried about the government's long-term intent. They are particularly concerned about the arbitrary decisions which will take some semi-automatic firearms away from hunters, but leave others in their possession. As Paul Erngold, <coughs> Vice President Nunavut Tungavik, told our community, in his view, the proposed definition of assault-style firearm is problematic, and I quote, the definition is overly broad and covers many semi-automatic rifles used for hunting, or defense against predators in none of it. Inuit have treaty rights to hunt under the none of it agreement. Hunting is a necessity for survival for a lot of Inuit in none of it. Semi-automatic rifles, rifles are effective and necessary as a humane method to quickly dispatch animals and as a defense against polar bears, grizzly bears, and wolves. Inuit hunters are taught to prevent dangerous encounters and to scare away these predators, but that is not enough. It could mean life or death when one or more aggressive bears are breaking into your cabin or tent. You would need to be able to scare them away quickly, and you might not have the time to reload. If this bill is passed with the ban on semi-automatic firearms, we will have to shoot to kill, resulting in increased fatalities of wildlife. 
There are some provisions in the Act that we are not opposed to, but the broad definition of assault rifles is quite concerning to us. Colleagues, take note, this is a life and death situation for people up north. They are protecting their lives, their families' lives, and wildlife. For those hunters who depend on their firearms for subsistence, this is understandably very worrying. In response to this amendment, in response to this, an amendment was proposed to the committee to ensure transparency in the envisioned future regulatory process. Hunters deserve that sort of transparency, and in particular, Indigenous people who depend on subsistence hunting and whose rights are impacted and should be consulted. That is what the amendment proposed, colleagues. But unfortunately, as all the other amendments, the amendment was rejected by the government majority. Now what Indigenous and other hunters fear is that the government will do what it has already done in 2020, order and counsel, to arbitrarily select certain semi-automatic firearms for prohibition. We need to be clear. The measure that the government enacted in 2020 had absolutely no public safety benefit. In fact, it is one of the dumbest measures ever enacted by a Canadian government. This measure selected some semi-automatic long guns for prohibition largely for their look while leaving all others in legal circulation. In other words, one semi-automatic long gun is prohibited, but another semi-automatic long gun that may shoot precisely the same ammunition remains legal. Moreover, since the government says it will pay compensation to those firearms owners whose firearms have been arbitrarily prohibited, nothing prevents these firearm owners from simply using that money to purchase another semi-automatic firearm that may shoot precisely the same ammunition as the firearm that has been prohibited. This is liberal thinking to the nth degree. The parliamentary budget officer has estimated that this idiotic compensation program will cost taxpayers at least $750 million. And more. But what's a few dollars among friends is what the Liberals say. In essence, taxpayers will be paying firearms owners to hand in certain of their semi-automatic long guns so that they can use that money to go out and buy another semi-automatic long gun. Only this Liberal NDP government could come up with a program that is so utterly pointless, but still ends up costing taxpayers at least $750 million, as, as Senator Bovenu said, and probably more. Dr. Kalen Langsman, Assistant Clinical Professor of McMaster University, testified before our committee and he pointedly stated, the likely billions of dollars spent to confiscate firearms from legal firearms owners would probably be better spent on youth diversion and gang reduction programs, as well as programs in terms of suicide reduction and women's programs for leaving homes at risk. I see people coming in with suicidal ideation from issues they have in terms of depression, and it's extremely difficult to get them help. We look at wait times of over six months for some people. We have a shortage of physicians who are working in this area. Not only will these confiscation measures have no public safety benefit, they will literally rob frontline police and other workers of very scarce resources. How is this sort of public policy making acceptable? How can the Senate, which is supposed to exercise sober second thought, possibly sign off on a bill that confirms an order in council that is so stupid? Just to be clear, I am not against paying compensation given circumstances. Firearms owners acquired their firearms legally and in good faith, and they should be compensated when the government arbitrarily decides to prohibit their property and steal their property from them. But the policy itself makes no sense from a public policy perspective. In fact, 
what is being done is so wasteful and so pointless that it almost staggers the imagination. All of this simply to provide the illusion that the government is doing something. They are taking everything seriously. And that's the answer. We'll be given a question period tomorrow. We take it seriously. In my remarks up to this point, I have discussed what the bill fails to do despite the government's claims. Now I want to focus on just one of the bill's most negative impacts, that being its impact on licensed sports shooters and collectors. These law-abiding Canadians may be modestly impacted or they may be very badly impacted. Let me begin with the collectors of handguns, including many who collect antique firearms. Tony Bernardo, executive director of the Canadian Shooting Sports Association, told our committee this. There are a number of large collections. There are a number of small collections. Some of the collections might be only two or three handguns. And those collections would be worth, for example, $2,000 or $3,000. But the larger collections could be well, worth well into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I would guesstimate that the overall value of handguns would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars across the entire country. So there is no question that collectors, many of whom are historical collectors, are very impacted. They can no longer sell or buy legal handguns and their collections are forfeited to the state when they die. Contrasts this obvious impact with what the minister told us. And again, I quote, the premise that this affects law-abiding gun owners who pursue sports activities, such as hunting or sports shooting, is a phrase that is often used. We have been explicit and careful to ensure that these measures do not target those people. They are not targeted or affected or included in these measures. It's the minister, with a straight face, he told us that. With a straight face. Once again, the minister's statement simply has no connection to reality. None. Some senators are cavalier about this outcome. Senator Kuchar shrugged his shoulders in committee and simply said that Canadians do not have a constitutional right to own firearms. He offered no criticism of the fact that the governments in this country have for decades asked sport shooters to play by the rules and to abide by very strict conditions related to ownership of handguns. Those legal firearm owners have always abided by the rules. But now the government has arbitrarily decided to change those rules and it offers absolutely nothing in terms of an apology or compensation. At least our Prime Minister, who is so good at apologizing for everything everybody in this country has done, should at least apologize for this. Senator Kuchar can be cavalier about that sort of betrayal, but in my view it is completely unacceptable. Ironically, it will also ensure that no restricted gun owner will hand over their firearms. Those guns will remain in private hands, something which the government purports to be so worried about. How exactly does that enhance public safety? The truth, of course, colleagues, is it doesn't. Freezing someone's collection of antique or other historic pistols is a ridiculous measure. Even for senators on the government side, that should be more than obvious. Let me now turn to the impact that this bill will have on specific shooting sports. The truth is that shooting sports in Canada will be destroyed by this bill. They will be eliminated. The government has claimed that it is protecting Olympic and Paralympic level competition in all of this. Again, the minister before our committee said, we're not affecting the ability of these elite athletes to access firearms they need for their sporting competitions. It's not only the persons who go to these international competitions representing Canada, 
It's those who are training and getting ready to one day hopefully have the opportunity to do that. But of course, none of that is accurate. It isn't even accurate today, and the bill is not in force yet. In this regard, Senator Deacon asked the chief firearms officer who appeared before a committee how they have navigated the prohibition on the purchase of handguns by Olympic athletes since the government imposed its order in council last year. Dr. Terry Bryant, Chief Firearms Officer of Alberta, told us, we have not been successful in securing an exemption for Olympic level shooters, even once. I am unaware of anyone, anywhere who has. Not even once. I am unaware of anyone, anywhere who has. Again, remember that the minister told us the Olympic level competitors are specifically exempted and there is no intent to impact them. That colleagues obviously is completely false. We were told by a previous speaker not to call a duck a duck at times, and I'm paraphrasing, but I am not allowed to call the minister what he did here. This is false, colleagues. He is not telling us the truth. Now the minister is again promising that going forward, he will consult because he's serious about it. He will consult about how to actually exempt Olympic and Paralympic shooters from the effects of this bill. He wrote a letter to this effect, which Senator Yusuf has proudly quoted. The minister says, I want to assure the committee that consultations will take place so to clearly establish the process for elite sport shooter exemption. How do you square that? Will take place. Earlier he said they have taken place. With all due respect, given the minister's track record, this statement means absolutely nothing and has zero credibility. In particularly, it means nothing because below the Olympic level, the government makes no pretense. All of these other shooting sports are to be annihilated. Since nobody starts competition at the Olympic level, this means that Olympic quality competitors as well, will soon not be fielded by Canada at all because nobody begins at this level. Colleagues, it may come as a surprise to you, but Wayne Gretzky didn't start playing hockey in the NHL. He actually started on an ice rink in his backyard when he was three years old. He practiced, he bought hockey sticks. They weren't disallowed. They weren't illegal. But here our sports shooters are supposed to start in the Olympics. Robert Freeberg is the Chief Firearms Officer for Saskatchewan, and he was once an Olympic level competitor. This is what he told our committee. I was an Olympic target shooter, but I didn't start there. Surprise, surprise. I started in another sport, shooting, and then I developed some skills. And they said, hey, you've got an ability to do this. And I slowly started to move up into shooting in the Olympic sports. And eventually, even though as I aged, my eyes went. I can feel it. I went off to shoot in other sports because I wasn't able to compete in the Olympic realm anymore. But at least I had another place to go and enjoy my sport. That's gone. There is no way to feed in the Olympic system. And there is no way for us right now, currently with these regulations, they are just refusing to pass the application. So this will not only kill all shooting sports, it will also leave former Olympic athletes with an unclear path of even recouping their investments in their own sport. These athletes will have no ability to mentor new athletes because there just won't be any. Linda Geico is a civil engineer and an Olympian, testified before our committee, and she was very clear on that point. And she said, and I quote, target shooting is one of the most inclusive 
lifelong sports in the world, and one Canadians should consider valuable. Target shooting sports provide a level playing field that no other sport really provides. All people, all body shapes, all genders, able-bodied, otherwise, it doesn't matter. We can all compete shoulder to shoulder against each other on a level playing field. That, colleagues, is completely gone, out of the window. Colleagues, I've been here since 2009. I have seen many bills go through this chamber, and I have seen some bad bills before. But frankly, there is no bill that is as absurd as this bill. And in this regard, I want to quote from what Professor Christian Lupert told our committee based on his analysis. Instead of being honest with Canadians and devising constructive policies that will actually curb the northbound torrent of crime guns from the United States, this bill constructs a false narrative against four million lawful, licensed, background-checked firearms owners. This legislation is a cynical ploy to polarize Canadian society by leveraging firearms as a wedge issue ahead of the next federal election. That is not Pierre Polyev that said that, colleagues. In over 20 years of studying public safety and national security across democratic countries, I have never seen a bill with this great a disconnect between its supposed means and ends. Any parliamentarian who votes in favor of this bill is going on record as disdaining evidence supporting derision, fanning polarization, encouraging disinformation. Disinformation, Senator Gold, you're so quick with using that word every time we say something, and wasting scarce public resources on policy measures that miss their intended targets. I do not think there could be a more succinct or accurate summary of the bill that we have before us. I just want to add an additional comment in relation to this. I understand the sentiments that underscore this bill. I understand the sentiments of those who are victims of crime, and particularly those who are victims of gun violence. I can assure you there is no senator on the committee who did not have the most profound sympathy for Samantha Price and all the other victors, victims of senseless gun violence who appeared before our committee. But we need solutions that actually work. And as I have said before, conservatives support reasonable gun control. We support licensing. We support safe storage laws. We support mandatory firearms training. We support thorough police background checks. But colleagues, what we are doing is a disservice to Canadians if we just give in and pretend that a bill like this will seriously address the problem of gun violence in any real way. We are also doing an dis extreme disservice to the victims of gun violence, who will be the first to realize that. As it turns out, Bill C-21 means nothing, nothing in terms of addressing such violence. I am now thinking of the appearance of Mr. Bofelja Benadala the co-founder and spokesperson for the Islamic Cultural Center of Quebec City. We know about the terrible massacre that occurred there. Six people were murdered in a place of worship. Others seriously injured. I cannot imagine, I cannot imagine the horror suffered by the families that face this unspeakable crime, a crime of this nature. If we are considering root causes, what we are dealing with in an event like that is almost unimaginable 
is an almost unimaginable amount of hate. Hate of that nature is part and pa parcel of most of the mass shootings that we see. But how does one realistically ensure that such events can never happen? I believe it is virtually impossible to ensure such an outcome, given what history teach us, teaches us about human beings, what we are capable at our very worst. A simplistic solution is to say that more gun, gun control is the answer. The government chose that approach when it randomly prohibited certain semi-automatic firearms, but not others. As Senator Yusuf himself has noted, there are at least 12 million guns in Canada. Even after Bill C-21 is enacted, there will still be at least 12 million guns in Canada. We have witnessed other mass killings where the weapon used was an automobile. In Toronto in 2018, a van was used to kill 11 people and injure many more. Without transforming the human soul, we will not stop these sorts of events. What also concerns me in relation to the Quebec tragedy is the message we send as a society and how we responded to this attack. Initially, the perpetrator of this crime was sentenced to life in prison with no ch chance of parole in 40 years. To be frank, in my opinion, that was a sentence that was too light, given the terrible crime that this individual committed. Yet, for our Supreme Court justices, the sentence was too harsh. So they reduced that sentence to ensure that the perpetrator would be eligible for parole one day so he could commit this crime again. Quite frankly, this is an outrageous decision, which the Government of Canada simply accepted, even though it had the legislative options to say to the court, no, we do not agree with your decision and we will reverse it. As a society, we cannot just roll over and accept decisions that fail to hold perpetrators of the worst crimes morally responsible. But that is what this government does time and time again. It is simply wrong <coughs> to instead enact gun control laws that we know will not work. It is particularly very wrong for the government to target 650,000 Canadians and make them scapegoats for what is wrong with society. That is just simply wrong. But that is what we have in Bill C-21. This is a bill designed in Ottawa by people who are looking for simplistic talking points and who quite frankly do not understand other parts of the country. Does it remind you of another bill that we dealt with earlier today? We heard that complaint from many of our witnesses. We heard it from Indigenous people, including our Inuit witnesses who spoke about the fact that in the North, they don't even have their own chief firearms officers. Instead, the chief firearms officer for the North resides in Southern Canada. People in Toronto and Montreal know what's best for the farmers in Saskatchewan. That is a large part of the problem with this entire bill. It is a bill designed in Ottawa by a central Canadian elite that simply does not understand, or quite frankly care to understand, other parts and peoples of Canada. In that sense, Bill C-21 is just like Bill C-68 three decades ago. And it will fail for the very same reasons. Make no mistake, colleagues, this bill will be reversed. That's the silver lining here. This bill will be reversed. That is the inevitable outcome of what we are doing today. But in the years in between, all we will have accomplished is to sow yet more division in our wonderful country. Now, I have been accused of delaying this bill. The minister has said 
and other government members in the other place have said as well that it is all part and parcel of the go this government's wedge politics. That is all part and parcel of this government's wedge politics. I was told I was delaying this bill before it was ever introduced in this chamber. Before it ever even got here, I was already, the, the, the tweets were out there by the government. Senator Platt is stalling Bill C-21. But Bill C-21, even though it is one of the dumbest bills ever enacted by the current government, has progressed through the Senate. And they have many. In accordance, and they have many, and they have many. And the sad part is that uh, they have some time left to introduce more. But the bill has progressed through the Senate in accordance with the schedule negotiated between the Liberal government, the leader of the government in the Senate, and the leader of the Conservative opposition from day one to now. <coughs> all the meetings of the committee were scheduled by consensus between all members of the committee. And I quite frankly want to thank Senator Tony Dean for the collaborative way in which he dealt with members of our party in scheduling these meetings giving us the witnesses that we asked for. The Conservative opposition agreed to have committee members during the regular Monday time slots. We agreed to sitting during the Mondays after a break week. We agreed to meeting on Wednesdays during the Veteran Affairs Committee time slot and also on extra days. The bill finished clause by clause on December 4th exactly as we had agreed. Yet the political messaging by this government remained the same. The Conservatives are delaying the bill. For the record, I told Senator Gold last week that I wanted to speak today. I wanted to speak first. I'm the critic of this bill. Normally, we have a policy where the critic speaks last. I ask to speak first. Why? Because I'm delaying the bill? That doesn't make a lot of sense. I will admit the official opposition has been looking for a way to defeat this bill. Short of divine intervention, I don't think that will happen. But most of the witnesses who appeared before our committee either asked us to kill this bill or at least make major amendments, most of our witnesses. Unfortunately, we failed them. We tried, but we had a very strong, strong government contingent who said, we're putting this through. Whether it's a good bill or not is really irrelevant. It sends a good message, and we're going to put it through. But the reason we tried our best to do that is because this bill is not good for Canada, and Conservatives care about Canada. We care about our country, and it is not the end of anything. It is merely the beginning of what will be a regrettable requirement now to reverse extremely bad legislation. And we wanted to take every possible step to avoid such an outcome. But that is what this current government ultimately wants, and that is the outcome it has. In conclusion, and I know you've waited for those words for a long time. Now, some people in conclusion, conclusion that yeah, only means that, that's, the last, that's the last 20 minutes. I want to come back and focus on just one of the many problems of this bill. Just one. That is the matter of the impact that this bill will have on the entire range of shooting sports in Canada. It will not only kill shooting sports in Canada, 
It will also close civilian ranges that so many of our police services depend on in order to maintain their skill levels. Again, Senator Deacon. Senator Deacon is one of those Trudeau appointees that actually thinks for herself and has some good ideas. And this was one of them. She proposed an amendment in committee that was rejected by the government majority, but I believe we must reconsider now. I really think this needs to be reconsidered. I know Senator Youssef thinks that once it's dead, it should be dead, unless it's something that he doesn't support, then of course we make exception. Now that amendment would ensure that any shooting discipline be recognized as a legitimate for the purpose of an individual to purchase or sell handguns relevant to that discipline. Our committee heard considerable testimony on this issue. I have already referenced what Olympic athlete Linda Keiko told our committee. I also quoted what Mr. Robert Freeberg Chief Firearms Officer for Saskatchewan told our committee on the same issue. And I wish to have one more quote here, what James Smith, President of National Range Officers Institute of the International Practical Shooting Confederation told our committee. Even though Bill C-21 is not an outright handgun ban, it re will result in a slow demise for our sport in Canada having no athletes introduced to replace the existing competitors and being unable to replace equipment as it wears out will result in the end of our sport over time. It will close the ranges for police officers and other agencies that use our ranges for training and result in no shooting for Olympics. Nowhere in there, colleagues, did he say might. He said it will. The amendment originally proposed by Senator Deacon seeks to at least partially address a major flaw in this bill in that it will recognize all shooting disciplines. It requires that the handgun in question is appropriate and necessary for participating in that discipline. Some may argue that this amendment would restore the status quo when it comes to handgun purchases. Unfortunately, that is not the case. All this amendment would do is recognize more shooting disciplines under the auspices of this bill. It would require that in order to be involved in any shooting discipline, the individual would have to be a member of a club that offers such a discipline. I would just repeat what witnesses have said, that unless this bill recognizes and protects other shooting disciplines, that provide the shooters who may then be good enough to feed into the Olympic shooting, there is then absolutely no point in the Olympic level exemption that is already in the bill. Colleagues, these are the words you've all been waiting to hear for the last hour. And so I therefore ask you to support what I am going to propose. And I therefore move that Bill C-21 not now be read a third time, but that be thrown in the garbage. Actually, that Bill C-21 not now be read a third time, but that it be amended in Clause 43 on page 49 by replacing lines 27 to 34 with the following. One, that they are participating in a handgun shooting discipline. Two, the disciplines in which they participate. And three, that the handgun in question is appropriate and necessary for participating in those disciplines. Thank you, colleagues.